WLRN Video presents Check out this month's installment of Getting Organized, an activist primer with Elizabeth Miller, a new monthly segment for WLRN that will give you ideas and tools to do your own feminist activism. Every month, for Women's Liberation Radio News, Elizabeth interviews a feminist activist about her work. These interviews are meant to inspire and instruct feminists in how to organize their own activist projects. In August 2022, Elizabeth interviewed Dawn Smith, the founder and organizer of Michigan Framley Reunion, an annual women's music festival. Dawn talked about how she was inspired to create Michigan Framley Reunion after attending the last Mitch Fest in 2015, and how she founded, organized, and continues to run the festival. Listen now. So I am here with Dawn Smith, who is the organizer of Michigan Family Reunion. And I want to thank you for being here, Dawn. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. And um, I want to ask you, what gave you the idea to, well, what is MFR, first of all? Where did you get the idea to do it? And then how did you do it? I mean, this is a big endeavor, a big undertaking that you make happen every year. and I'd love for women to hear how you do it. Um, MFR stands for Michigan Framley Reunion. Um, Framley comes from friends that we choose to have as our family. Um, The idea for it came after 2015, which was the last year for um, Michigan Women's Music Festival. And I went to that and I came home and I run a lesbian social club in Lansing. And a lot of the people that were part of that were part of Mishfest, had been there for a long time. And I just, for myself, I knew I was going to miss that space, even though I'd only been in it for one time. Um, And I knew that a lot of the friends and a lot of the people that had invested plus 20 years into this festival, really going to, there's going to be a big void in August during that time. So um, me and my ex-partner, who was also ex-producer, decided to have a family reunion, a reunion. And it, the intention was for Mishfest women to come, sisters, but also some of the um, L2L Lansing lesbian community that had never been part of festival to bring them together and introduce that kind of woman's space. Um, it was a one day event in my backyard in 2016. And um, honestly, I just started asking people. I just started asking people like, different women in the community. How do I do this? How do we put this together? Susan Frazier was one of them. Um, Sally Potter, who's performing at MFR this year. Um, She's active in the women's community here in Lansing and just started asking a bunch of people. Drum Mama Sue, I don't know if you knew her, met her, but she was very active in um, Mishfest. And so I started asking them and they all just, we all just started meeting and talking about what we're going to do and how we're going to build this space. Um, Susan helped with the musical, like who could I call in for performers? And I just like, I didn't know how to negotiate contracts or what to pay or who to get. So I just started with some regular people like Karen and Mimi were two of my first performers. You know, I asked some people that had been at Mishfest and they were like, we're in, we're just in. And we're still friends today. Um, So it was truly a community effort that I might've bossed around and called in people, but it really was just finding the people who knew how to do it. You know, finding an electrician and a builder who could build the physical space, Um, finding performers who could create the musical space, finding vendors that would be willing to sell their product here um, to create that whole community space. Because like other people go to music festivals And it's just a musical festival. It's a concert with a lot of concerts. But if you've been to a woman's festival, just a woman's festival, you know that it's much more than that. It's, it's, It's a community space. Like you're going into that space for the music, yes, but to get away from the world. Um, 
Area 51 was coined at Mishfest and it kind of carries over that place where we go for the 51 weeks out of the year where we have to put on our work face, our mom face, our friend face, our wife face, all and our protection, all of the armor we put on to be in the world as a woman. And, and we don't even realize what armor we put on. We don't realize these things because we're so used to them. We walk to the parking lot, we carry our keys, we walk out of our door, we look around, we see what's happening. We, we have awareness of our situation um, all the time. And we don't even realize how much armor until we start taking it off and we realize how light we are when we're in a woman's space. Like how, like you feel like you lo lose 50 to hundred pounds because it's so heavy and you don't even know it. People who've not women who've never experienced space without men don't realize how heavy we are until we get into a space without men. Wow. It, it, it's just, and yeah. so that was probably my primary motivation. Like you just don't know. Women just don't know until they do it. Yeah. I've heard so many women say that to me. Yeah. That's exactly what everyone says after they go to a women's festival for the first time. Yeah, it, it's just, it's life-changing. Yeah. So how did you go? So the first year was in your backyard for one day. Yes. So that was obviously like one vision, like kind of almost like a regular family reunion. You know, people often have things in their backyards for one day. True. How did you like conceptually go from that to thinking, okay, I'm going to take this to a next level. Like wow. for the second year or the third year, or whenever it was like, how did you, what changed in your brain? And like, what kind of gave you the courage to be like, yeah, I'm going to make this something bigger. Well, first of all, do not ever give me a microphone when I'm ramped up on adrenaline. <laughs> because at the end of that day, I was like, next year, it's going to be three days. I got off the stage and my committee was like, what the heck is she doing? I didn't know either. So from that point, um, we started looking for some property and we didn't have that much money. We had a little bit of money in the bank left over, but we didn't have money. Um, my ex-partner actually had more money than I did. Um, and that first year, 2017, once we found the space, a local lesbian that I was friends with, part of my group, um, donated our current site for us to use her hundred acre farm. Um, once we decided we were gonna have it there, we walked that space. Like it was the middle of winter, like February. And we're like, okay, it's snowy. How do we put this? And we had to conceptualize the stage area, the marketplace, where do people camp? Where, do, where does everything go? Where are the showers? where like we had to envision the whole layout of the current MFR which we did but then after we envisioned it we had to clear it all because it was all crap and build it like there was so, just so all the building. open areas that are there now you had to clear those we had to cut trees down we chipped trees we cut them we holy we holy. we cleared it literally wow. cleared it from brush and trees and then had to put in electrical and plumbing and all of the infrastructure things to to make a festival so you can have music and have showers in the woods and have water and had to figure out all of those components we were very very blessed my ex-partner did invest a whole bunch of money into it i was just going to ask you like did you put forth your own personal money and then just hope that you would make it back from the proceeds of the festival Yes, we were very hopeful. She did. I mean, it, it was a, definitely a leap of trust. She put a lot of her money into it at that initial year. That money was paid back after that first year, 2017, we did pay it back. And then from that point, MFR has been self-sufficient, a dog chasing a squirrel. Um, so yeah, that first year she invested a bunch of money. It was paid back after 17, um, that festival. And then from that point, we have some MFR has supported itself. Um, that was 2017 was a very, very, very challenging year because there was so many big to go from a one day event to a three day event. 
it's like not just add like, a couple of days. Yeah, you have to add everything. You yeah. have to add everything, food, water, electricity, transportation. It, it, it there was so much more than I, I realized when I said we were going to do it. Yeah. And did you do all of the logistics yourself or you and your partner, or did you get other friends to sort of that you could delegate certain things to? Um, most of it was done I, like the logistical part. My ex was an electrician. So she and her dad actually, um, did planned all the wiring and the plumbing. She was a builder. So she planned that part of it. Um, we bought a tractor with a lot of different parts, but it was not just me and her out there working. She planned that part and she organized that part of it. Um, the clearing and all those other parts we had tons, tons of volunteers. So we masterminded it, but we didn't do all the work. And how did you find people to volunteer? You seem like you're really good at that, <laughs> getting people to volunteer for things. That's a compliment. By yes, um, truly. It, I, and I realize that's a compliment. I have to go back to raising eight kids you learn yeah, to ask I can see for the help. connection there. Yeah. Asking for help is very humbling for most people. Um, and we forget that when we ask for help, it's an energy exchange. I'm asking you to help, which is humbling. And I get to feel gratitude and all the things that come with the blessings. But the person who gives also gets an exchange. They, they are able to empower, they are able to gift. They, are, they also get to be gra grateful for the blessings that they have that they can share. So being able to ask for help is a leap of faith on both ends because the person giving and the person asking are both taking a leap of faith that there's gonna be some kind of exchange because otherwise you don't take that chance. And that was a big part of it, asking for help all, all the time, always asking for help. And it's hard. It's, it's not always very comfortable, you know, asking for financial help, asking for physical help, asking people that have more knowledge, skills, talents, and hoping that somebody will step up and help you. Most of the that time, really is a huge leap of faith because you commit to do this event, but you can't do it all by yourself. So you have to just believe that people are going to step in and help you. And if they don't, it's going to be really bad. <laughs> it's why when, like, you've seen me a couple of times at work cruise, Becky's seen me a lot more. And I, I, afterwards, at the end of the day, I'm like, my mind is just blown from all of the magic. Cause that's what I see it as. I ask and magic just appears. So, and, yeah. and magic comes in the form of people and time and talent and treasure, you know, and you never know where you're going to get it because you just start asking and you trust that somebody will have and be willing to share with what you need. Yeah. And one thing I found um, at the work crew that I went to is that one of the cool things about being there as a volunteer is you realize that you can do things you didn't know you can do. Like you can use, you know, equipment to hack down tree trunks and, you know, like I didn't know I could do stuff like that, <laughs> you know? So that's a really good feeling to find out that you can do stuff that seems intimidating. And you can use things in ways that people maybe won't use. Like we have this idea that things are supposed to be a certain way and used a certain way and done a certain way. And it really took me a lot to learn that it doesn't, just because somebody says a bracket is supposed to be used for a bracket doesn't mean I can't use it for something else. I so, think of your golf cart when you say that. Right. Like there's so many things that I've reused in different purposes than what they're intended. And I used to be so intimidated by big box, like a Home yeah. Depot or Menards or whatever. And now I go in there, they still intimidate me and cause me anxiety attacks, but I wander around there and I'm like, oh, I learned the names of the parts yeah. and the tools and then what they're supposed to be for, but what I can use them for. Yeah. Like I can do it any way I want to do it because who's the boss? Yeah. Who's the boss? Yeah. yeah. Like you took pieces. Didn't you take pieces of the Mishfest stage that you bought and make them into benches? Benches and tables and all kinds of things. Like we just have, it, it just, 
the space looks so much more intentional. Like this is a place for people to hang out. It's not just the woods. Like there's benches and you walk through and you're like, oh, oh, I can see it now. You are listening to WLRN. So, yeah. How have things changed over the years that you've been, or what has changed over all the years you've been doing MFR and what has stayed the same? And what would you like to change? I guess that's three different questions. Um, A big thing that has changed is the organizational structure. When, um, When my ex stepped out and she had amazing skills, you know, broad skills, electricity, plumbing, building. Um, And I had to figure out how we were going to do these parts. And we didn't, I didn't have the knowledge. I had little pieces of knowledge. And from that point, first, we took taking a leap of faith that we're going to be able to do this. Second, sharing the knowledge with everything, everybody. Like this is a community building thing. You get to learn how to use a power washer and saws and everybody gets this knowledge. Everything that we do now goes up on a Google Drive. Like there's a document to support every action that we do now. The knowledge is free to anybody who comes to festival if they ask, like I'm not just gonna put it out on the internet, but it is available and it will never just be me having knowledge because you know, knowledge is power. You know, if you have more knowledge, you can do more things. So now all of our people, all of the people that are working towards this have that knowledge. And we restructured the the work, the volunteer structure. So they're more empowered. The grounds crew has a supervisor. They're empowered. They get a budget. They do what they need to do. The security has their own supervisor. They're all empowered to run that area. I just coordinate it all. If there's big things or bigger money or bigger things like that, that are going to significantly change the structure of the flow of the festival, we, we will talk about it. But overall, I, I take a much more hands-off approach to those things. Um, so there's more women that are empowered. That's, I think that's really smart that you realize that as it gets bigger and also just to do this year after year, you can't have your hand in every pot. Like you can't be in the nitty gritty details of every single aspect all the time. You have to have, you have to empower other people to do those and then they can report back to you. Right. Um, And what has, what other things have changed over the years that you've been doing it? Like how has it evolved? Um, You know, the first year, that and and when I'm referencing the first year, I'm going to be talking about when we were since we've been in Wayland because that was the big building year and we became the weekend. Um, oh, I lost my whole train of thought since we've been it was since we've changed from that structure and that space. Oh, I did. I lost my. Oh, whole I was thought. gonna. I was asking you like how it has evolved over. Say what has it been? How many years has it been in that space? Like five years. Yep. It's this so will be how our. How has it? What big things have changed? What kind of evolution has happened in the fest over those years? Well, our electricity is completely independent now. From it used to be based on being drawn off the homeowners. So now MFR has its own electrical meter. We're independent there. The water was coming off there, the homeowner's well. We now have our own well. So water and electric are completely independent. Um, We don't have to clear as much. Like next year, next year will not be a building year. We spent lots of money on infrastructure this year. Next year will basically be a cleanup and open up. And, And that's a pretty good place to be. Like, let's just clean up the trails and turn the key and we're, we're ready to go. It, it's become a much closer to turnkey operation. And did you fundraise to get the money for the electrical and the well? We did. And, and it, like related to that, do you usually have any money left over at the end of the festival or do you just make enough to like cover the we cost? We had some money left over last year which was amazing because we've never had that much money left over. So with the money that was left over, we'd made, I, me and the committee made a decision to invest in a well. Um, 
it, it's been a big struggle with water because we've used big water totes, 275 gallon water totes. But when we lost our tractor, we couldn't move them around. So we had to get creative with our solution for water because water is life. Um, so this year we'd put in a well and then realized we also need to upgrade the electrical. At that point, we were out of money. Um, the ticket money that was coming in is going to pay for the expenses of the year and we're not part of that expense of the electrical. So yes, put a call out for a fundraiser um, purely to support, support the electrical and somebody donated a matching fund, $5,000 matching fund, and the community stepped up and raised the other $5,000 and we were able to complete the electric for $10,000. Like it literally came in at like 9837 or something. Like it, it was perfect. That's great. So yes, big changes this year. Yeah. And what going forward, like what's your vision? I, well, I guess I should ask you, do you intend to keep doing this? And if so, what's your yeah. vision for the future? What I would do. you like to change? How would you... Do you want it to kind of stay as it is, but just be able to continue? Or do you, are there big changes you want to make? I would like to add a day or two. There's been multiple requests to make it a longer festival. So um, we would like to add another day. I don't know if that'll be in 23, possibly adding Thursday to the, um, to the schedule, um, ultimately making it, you know, four to five days. Um, but we'll do that gradual, not a big, huge jump but we have the structure to support that now. So adding a day or two to the festival, projects that would be in the works, um, stage is a big expense. So it would be nice to be able to get a cover for the stage area because the covering is the biggest expense. We can find a stage anywhere, but you've got to protect the equipment. So that would be a project and set up another bank of showers. Now that we have a well, we could set up a bank of showers that's more central. So yes, we're going to continue. Yes, I have plans for more improvements. They probably won't happen next year. Yeah. Just, you know, because you can't spend money all the time. Yeah. So what are the other things at MFR besides music? So you have, you have a stage each evening with various performers, right? Talk, so talk a little bit about that. And then what else there is besides music? The stages start um, Friday at three o'clock, Saturday at three o'clock and Sunday at three o'clock. Um, this year we have 15 performers. It's a mix of spoken word, open mic, um, folk, acoustic, some rock. We got some drummers coming in. Um, and then besides the stage performance, we have um, workshops throughout the property. Um, some of them are out in the Pines. A lot of them are at the L2L Lounge. L2L Lounge is a big canopy that's at the top of stage that will have workshops. It has, it's a lounging place. And that's where the dances are. There's dances on Friday and Saturday night. And we have a marketplace. So you can do shopping. We have two food trucks and a coffee stand and lots of women and campfires. We have a new campfire this year. Oh. Um, yep, we're gonna, the top of the stage used to be chem free. Um, and we're trying to figure out what to do with the smokers. And, um, so that is not going to be chem free anymore. That's going to be general. So there will be smoking allowed up at the top of the, at the fire pit at the top of the stage. And we made a new area for a chem free fire pit. That's kind of behind that, um, marketplace. Oh, cool. So you'll have three, three fire pits. One, two, three, four, four. Oh, oh four. Night oh, owl, four. woman of color. Um, chem free in general. Okay. Oh yeah. Talk a little bit about the woman of color space. Um, the woman of color space is specifically for women of color, indigenous women. It's a space that's separate so they can have workshops, drumming, dancing, whatever they want to do in there. It's a space just like we have multiple layers of protection when we're in the world. Uh, people of color have even more than we do. Um, while we might have it rough, we also live in a state of privilege just by virtue of being white. And we don't realize that. We can't experience it because we don't know. Just like a man can't know the protection we put on because they have never done it. We can't know the different ways that people of color have to protect themselves, their spirit, their body, their physical sense. So um, the woman of color space is set up 
just for them. Um, white women are only allowed in with permission and invitation. Um, that is organized by Journey. Um, and last year, I, well, I think every year we've had some issues, but last year the issues were shared with us. So one new thing that's coming in in 22 is there's also a patio for white women to meet, talk about ways to fight racism, how to do better, how to operate in the world as better allies. Um, so that will be positioned close to the women of color space to protect and safeguard that space, but also to provide ourselves with more education. That sounds great. Um, and the workshops and the vendor area, who, who provides those things? Um, I have a workshop coordinator, Tiffany. She coordinates the whole schedule and clearing those areas. The vendors are organized by Angie and she, I, I'm so thankful for him because I don't know that much about him. She just gives me a list at the end and says, send bills. So um, she coordinates all of that and a silent auction, which the silent auction is to do fundraiser for MFR, specifically for scholarships. Um, oh, so you provide some scholarships to people, to women who have- The silent auction is, a, is specifically to raise money for scholarship fund. Okay. And the workshops, um, who does the workshops? Like who presents them? Festival goers. Festies um, can submit a workshop application. Um, they are vetted, but they're not restricted based on our policy, our, our, our politics. The workshops are set up as a, as a place of discourse. It, it's to promote discussion. Yes, education but also discussions. So there might be workshops that you don't agree with and there might be workshops that you do agree with and both will be welcome because it's important for us to educate ourselves, you know, and we can't do that if we are only listening to things we fully support. Absolutely, yeah. And the vendors are, um, are they like big stores or are they individual nope. women, crafts women and- that's what they are. Individual women. Some of them have outside stores. Some of them don't. Um, most of them, this is their job and they are all women and it's smaller cottage industries that support women. Nice. All right. Well, um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we finish up? Come to MFR. <laughs> I agree with that. Everyone should come to MFR. It's really a wonderful, wonderful experience. That's all I got. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Don, for talking to us. And thank you for doing MFR because I I've been twice and this year will be my third year. And I absolutely love going. And I um, encourage anyone who can get to Michigan, which, you know, anyone can get to Michigan. <laughs> I, I do have one. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you asked about crowdsourcing and fundraising. Um, one of the incentives to encourage people to donate to the electrical was they get to put their name on one of those benches that we built. And so now we have little plaques that we are going to be putting for women who will have their names on benches. Um, so that's going to be exciting this year. That is very exciting. Well, this whole endeavor is exciting. I'm, I'm so impressed by what you've done. And I also am so grateful that I get to partake in it. I just love it. My, my group of friends in Chicago, like just looks forward to it all year and we're super excited. So, and we're actually going to be having a radical feminist tent, um, off in the, off in the pines, which will be just like a place where radical feminists can come and chat, um, and share ideas. And so I'm also excited about that and the music and the workshops and the, the vending and everything. I'm super, and the outdoor showers. I love the outdoor showers. Really oh my great. gosh. You, you couldn't see the picture probably, but I took a picture. I strung, um, because we have electricity down there instead of putting solar lights, I just ran Christmas lights through there. So ah. it looks so pretty. That's great. Yeah, there's nothing like an outdoor shower. It's just so much more refreshing somehow. Somehow. Even with the mosquitoes, it still yeah, is refreshing. <laughs> it really is. All right. Thank you so much, Don. Thanks, Elizabeth. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that installment of Getting Organized, an activist primer with Elizabeth Miller. My name is April No. 
and I have been a member of WLRN for over four years. I love co-creating radical content with and for women. Maybe you have some spare time on your hands and would like to be a part of a totally excellent radical feminist team. If so, please send a letter of intent to info at womensliberationradionews.com. Thanks for staying radical, sisters.